Yeah, so we let's move on to the next talk now, which will be uh, Fern Gasso uh, from the University of Sydney, and they will be telling us how to use representation theory for combinatorics. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Will, and thanks to the organizers for this conference. Hopefully everyone's having a first good day. So yeah, so I'm Fern, I'm at the University of Sydney. Uh, this is based on work that I kind of did in my honors project last year. Uh, and this year in September, I'm moving to Oregon, for my PhD. So if anyone's uh, from around there, let me know. I'd be keen to know some people. Uh, but anyway, so hopefully this can be a little bit of an introduction to representation theory. And if you already know some, um, kind of a new tool you can use. So we're gonna look at a fixed point counting problem. So this is just kind of a like basic combinatorics problem. And we're gonna find some sort of surprising solution using linear algebra. Uh, and then I wanna discuss this in sort of the wider context of representation theory. Uh, this talk can also be kind of seen as a part two to this video that came out last week by Three Blue and Brown, uh, who talks about solving this question about kind of the discrete problem using complex numbers. Uh, and we're gonna use a lot of similar ideas here. Luckily, not too similar. I got a bit worried when this video came out. So anyway, uh, into the problem. So we'll let XK be the set of subsets of one to N of size K and we we'll allow for repeating elements. So this is X2 uh, when N equals four. And then we're gonna define an action on our set. So really just a bijection sigma, uh, which increments all the elements. And the question is, we know the size of XK, it's gonna be N plus K minus one choose K, but how many of these sets are fixed by D iterations of our sigma map? So I think the example is gonna help. So for example, we have the set one, one, we iterate every element. So we get two, two, then three, three, four, four. And then to make everything like finite, four goes back to one. Uh, then we have this other four cycle, but then we also have a two cycle. So the set one, three gets incremented to two, four, and then that goes back to one, three. And so we have two sets fixed by sigma squared, 10 sets fixed by sigma to the four. Uh, and we can also ask this question for sort of all integers. So for example, uh, sigma to the hundred will be fixed by the same thing as sigma squared because the order is four. Uh, so we can ask this for any integer. And I want, I want to say, I give you some integer, uh, tell me how many of the sets are fixed. By that integer. Okay, so the main tool we're going to use is from linear algebra. And the idea is suppose, like we have, uh, we have some bijection on a set X, which we'll call pi. And then we construct this vector space where the basis is essentially uh, in bijection with X. And now pi acts on these basis elements just by permutation. So it takes the basis element BX to B of the image uh, under pi. And then, of course, it also acts on linear combinations. So we get a full action on our uh, vector space. And so we can write a matrix. This is called a permutation matrix because we're just permuting the basis elements. And the thing I want to point out is whenever you have fixed points of our permutation, so in this case, two and four, um, so the basis element B2 gets mapped to B2. And so these appear as diagonal entries on our matrix. And the moral of our story and kind of our, our key line for this entire talk is going to be the trace counts fixed points. So the trace of the matrix is the sum of these diagonal entries and that counts the fixed points. And because we're doing linear algebra, we have lots and lots of tools for calculating the trace of a matrix. So let's start with the easiest case, K equals one. So all of our sets are just size one, so they're just singletons. Uh, so we just have the set, like the second containing one up to the second containing N. And then Sigma acts on these by the first basis element goes to the second, the second to the third. And then the last basis element N goes back to one. Uh, so we get this, this matrix form. And luckily, this is fully diagonalizable. So the eigenvalues for this matrix are uh, the nth roots of unity. So we need, we need complex numbers here. And the eigenvectors are just some, some eigenvectors in n-dimensional space. Um, and so we have this eigenbasis E such that sigma acts diagonally uh, on this basis. And so we can already find the trace. Uh, so the trace of sigma in this case is just going to be the sum of the nth roots of unity. Uh, which will usually be zero. And this makes sense because uh, if you just increment each set, you're not gonna get the same thing back. Okay, but this kind of toy example is to help us do the general case. So now we look at XK. So these are the K element sets. Uh, and the idea is we associate each set with this sort of tensor product of basis elements. And if you don't really know what the tensor product is, it's fine for now. Just think of it as sort of a formal symbol. Like don't, don't worry about uh, what it means. Just think about it as some list of the basis elements. Okay, so now if you think, how does sigma act on, on these basis elements? So we have a set and we increment each value. And so sigma acts on each component separately and just increments each component. Um, for example, 
we take the set one, one, two, four, it gets mapped to the set two, two, three, one. And then because four maps back to one. Uh, and then we allow this extra condition that you can rearrange the base elements and keep everything the same. So in algebra language, we call this the k-fold symmetric tensor product. Uh, but if you don't know what that means, that, that's okay. Just think about it as we increment each basis element and then we can rearrange things. And kind of the key observation is that the basis for this vector space uh, is given by these, these k-fold products with increasing values. Uh, because if they're not increasing, we can just swap them around until they're, well, they're weakly increasing because we allow repeated elements. So we have some basis for a vector space. We have the action of sigma on the vector space and then the trace counts fixed points. So we're looking for the trace uh, of this action of sigma. And in k equals one, we use this diagonal basis. And so we can do the same thing. Uh, we construct this new basis for our space by taking the k-fold tensor product of the eigen basis. So we take weakly increasing sequences and we take these EIs instead of the BIs. And then sigma acts on our uh, vector space by acting on each component. And then it acts on each component by scalar multiplication because uh, these are eigenvectors. And the tensor product, product lets us pull out all the scalars to the front. And so we actually get a new eigenbasis. So sigma acts on this uh, particular basis element by multiplication by zeta to the i1 up to zeta to the ik. And again, the trace counts fixed points. The trace of sigma will be the sum of the eigenvalues. So we sum over all uh, weakly increasing sequences of length k from one to n. And we take the relevant powers of zeta, take the products and then add up over all the sequences. And that gives us the fixed points of sigma. Uh, so we have a sum of complex numbers, but we get some non-negative integer, which, which perfectly counts our fixed points. But of course we have an eigenvector. Uh, so acting on it by uh, sigma d times just multiplies the eigenvalue to itself d times. And so we also can find the fixed points of every power of sigma. Uh, you just substitute in the relevant power of zeta into this polynomial. So it's quite an amazing result using these complex numbers to solve our, our discrete problem. Uh, and in fact, we can kind of do one better. So if we let this polynomial, uh, so we just replace every zeta with a Q. So this just lets us sub in every power of zeta that we want. Uh, it turns out that this polynomial when you sum over weakly increasing sequences is what we call the Q analog of the binomial coefficient. So uh, XK has size N plus K minus one choose K and we take this kind of factorial expansion of this thing and then replace every integer i with the polynomial one minus q to the i. So this gives us some uh, polynomial in q. It turns out the denominator cancels with the numerator. Um, and so subbing in q equals one counts the set exactly, uh, but even better subbing in powers of zeta gives us fixed points of powers of sigma. So this is kind of the amazing result. It's called the cyclic sieving phenomenon. Uh, if you want to look up more examples of this, but Hopefully that gives you a taste of sort of how these complex numbers are being used to solve this combinatorics problem uh, through the trace. So we can look back at our example. Uh, we have this, the two four cycles and the two cycle. And now if we evaluate this Q binomial coefficient, you just expand everything out, cancel the terms, uh, you get this polynomial. And now zeta will be the fourth root of unity. So we're substituting in powers of I. And you can see, for example, in that first term we'll get I squared plus one equals zero. So there are no fixed points of sigma. Uh, but if you substitute negative one, you'll get uh, two times one. So there'll be two fixed points. And then if you substitute in one, you get two times five. So there'll be 10 fixed points. And of course, because we're using roots of unity, you can substitute zeta to the hundred. And that will also be uh, zeta squared. Oh no, zeta to the four. Uh, so you can do this any integer d um, using the kind of nature of the, the cyclic nature of these complex numbers. Okay, so just to, just to summarize what we did before we extend this idea. Uh, so we started with some action on a finite set X, which is some bijection. In this case, our K-fold uh, sets where we incremented them. We linearized this action to an action on a vector space. Uh, and then we determined the matrix form for sigma using our eigenbasis. And then we computed the trace. Uh, and it turned out to be zeta evaluations of this, of this polynomial. And then the trace counts fixed points. And so we have our own fixed point theorem, uh, counting the fixed points of this action. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about how this all fits into the sort of general theory uh, of representation theory. So a representation, so G is a finite group. And if you don't know what that is, uh, just think of it as sort of a collection of actions, where if you take two of the actions and compose them, you get a new action, which also has to be an element of your group, as well as 
identities and inverses. So a representation is a map which assigns every element of your group to an action on your vector space V. And this sort of usual composition law has to hold. So if I do two actions in my group, that should be the product of the two operations. Uh, and I'm writing square brackets here because I'm really treating these operations as just matrices because uh, I can write every linear transformation as, as some matrix. Okay, so that's what a representation is. Uh, a character of a representation is this object that representation theorists care a lot about. Instead of assigning every element to its matrix, you assign it to the trace of the matrix. Uh, and the idea of this is that this is independent of the basis you choose for V. So you kind of get this really concrete thing which depends only on V and not on the, the basis you choose. And then this last sort of fact is that every representation splits uniquely into these irreducible representations. So to every group, it turns out you can associate finitely many irreducible representations and every other representation of the group is kind of built up of direct sums of these irreducibles. Uh, so in the case we saw before where sigma acted on our, our vector space, we had this eigenbasis uh, for our vector space. So V split up into uh, eigenspaces and then sigma preserved each of these eigenspaces. Uh, and in general, the same thing's gonna happen. V splits up as a direct sum of vector subspaces and the action of G preserves each of these subspaces. They act as their own sort of sub-representations. Uh, and the moral of this story, and the reason we care about characters and uh, irreducible representations, this is kind of the fundamental theorem of representation theory, that characters determine representations. So two representations are isomorphic, which has this specific meaning, uh, if and only if the characters are equal, which seems kind of amazing because you only need the information of the trace to sort of characterize representations. And then secondly, uh, the irreducible characters, so characters for irreducible representations can be used to build up all other representations in this very sort of canonical way. So we care lots about these irreducible characters and most of representation theory sort of goes into calculating these. Uh, so now we can sort of fill in the second part of the story. So before we had an action, which we extended to a vector space, but now we start with a representation on a vector space. And the goal is to find a basis for our vector space X and some element of G such that uh, that element just permutes the base elements of, of V. So it just permutes X, which means we get a permutation matrix. The trace counts fixed points. The character is the trace. So the character value um, will be the fixed points. So we'll see an example of this now. Uh, let's take the most famous group, which Aiden talked about a little bit, which is the symmetric group. So uh, these are the permutations on N objects. Uh, so just the number of ways to rearrange N objects. It's generated by these sort of adjacent swaps. And the first kind of beautiful theorem about the representation theory of the symmetric group is that to every partition of N, you can associate an irreducible representation. And there's this one-to-one -one correspondence. And the second beautiful fact is that if you take this representation associated to a partition lambda, then the basis for that vector space uh, is given by standard tableau of shape lambda. So in, in particular, the dimension of that space is equal to the number of standard tableau. So the standard tableau, uh, this is the case lambda equals three, two, one. They're given by filling in the boxes of lambda uh, such that the rows and the columns are increasing. So this is a really important kind of object in combinatorics. And it's pretty much important because uh, of its connections to the symmetric group in this way. And there's a beautiful theorem, which I can't not share uh, called the hook length formula. So I give you some partition lambda. So I give you a shape. And I say, how many ways can you fill in the boxes so that the rows and columns are increasing? Uh, and the answer to this question turns out to be this sort of algorithm. So you look at every box uh, and you calculate its hook length. So that's what I'm doing at the bottom left. So for every box I look, how many boxes are below and to the right? Um, that gives me the hook length of the box. I take the product of all the hook lengths and then n factorial divided by that product turns out to be the number of standard Young tableau. So this was discovered about 90 years ago. Uh, independently by like three mathematicians at the same time. In fact, they were presenting at a conference and they, they both wanted to present the same result. Um, so it's a beautiful formula, but we can kind of do one better. So we take the Q analog of this hook length formula. So just like we did with the binomial coefficient, uh, we expand out the factorial and the, and the hook lengths, and then we replace every integer with the associated um, polynomial. It turns out the denominator always cancels and we get this integer polynomial called the Q hook length formula. Uh, also, our replacement for sigma in this case is gonna be C, which is the long cycle. So just like sigma, uh, it, acts, it maps one to two, two to three, and then N back to one. 
And this is a kind of beautiful theorem from McDonald from about 50 years ago, which says that chi lambda is a character of this irreducible representation associated to some partition lambda. And then what it tells you is that evaluations of the trace at powers of the long cycle are given by the relevant zeta evaluation at the Q hook length formula. Uh, so again, zeta here is the nth root of unity. And so it tells you if I have some representation of the symmetric group, which, which is irreducible, so it corresponds to one of these uh, S lambdas, then the trace of powers of the long cycle are given by zeta evaluations of the Q hook length formula. So sort of a priori, you, these, these can be complex numbers. Um, and what we want to do is find some basis for our representation such that the long cycle acts by permutation on this basis. Uh, and if we can do that, then we get this formula, the trace counts fixed points and the trace is the character value. And so we can count fixed points using this, this Q hook length formula. Uh, and of course, we wouldn't have that build up unless this was true. Uh, so this was a, a huge result proved in 2010 by Rhodes. So the result has this one condition which says that suppose lambda is a rectangular partition. So really we need the shape of this partition to actually be a rectangle. Uh, and then you take the so you take the irreducible representation corresponding to lambda. Uh, and this has some special basis uh, called the kajdan lustig basis, which was already sort of very famous in, in representation theory. Um, but Rhodes managed to prove that if you act on the long cycle, uh, by the long cycle on some tableau, so there's some basis element corresponding to T, it actually acts by permutation and specifically this promotion operator on Tableau. Uh, and so the fixed points of the promotion operator are given by the character value of the long cycle, which is given by the zeta evaluation of the, the Q hook length formula. And so we get another beautiful result where it turns out these zeta evaluations turn out to be positive integers or, or zero, uh, and they actually count the fixed points of this action. So maybe a little underwhelming, uh, unless I actually tell you what this promotion operator on Tableau is, but it turns out to have quite a nice uh, sort of uh, method for computing it. So we take some tableau and I want to show you what the promotion of that tableau is. So we start by removing the, the smallest box. We remove one and now we play this sliding game and we try and move this box southeast, keeping everything like increasing on the rows and columns. So particularly we have to always swap with the smallest value. So we swap with two, move it east, swap with four, move it south, swap with six, move it east. It's going to get stuck in a corner at some point, uh, and we give it the next largest value. And now this is standard on the values two to nine. And so if we just decrease every value, we get something on one to eight. So sort of this strange operation, it's like this sort of puzzle game where you're sliding the boxes around, um, but to find some map on Tableau. And then Rhodes' theorem, so this is an example. Uh, so if we have a rectangular partition, in this case, there's a, there are five standard Tableau of this shape, there's a three cycle and a two cycle. Uh, we can evaluate the Q hook length formula. You just expand everything out. And then substituting in powers of the sixth root of unity count um, fixed points of powers of promotion. So there are two tableau fixed by promotion squared, three fixed by promotion cubed, uh, and all five tableau are fixed by the sixth power of promotion. And so it's a beautiful like, way of counting these fixed points. Um, the only obvious caveat is this only works for rectangular partitions. And the reason for this is sort of something to do with the symmetric group branching rule. But the, the takeaway is that actually, in general, we don't know the answer to this question. So we have a beautiful formula for rectangular cases, uh, but in non-rectangular cases, we don't have sort of any formula at all. Um, so if we take promotion acting on any shape, so I give you a shape and I say, how many tableau are fixed by the third power of promotion? Uh, it, it's very hard to do this. We, we don't have any way of doing this. Uh, and in fact, we don't even know the order of promotion acting on tableau of some arbitrary shape. So one obvious thing to try would be to look at this kajdan lustig basis that Rhodes defined um, and see if we get a permutation matrix. So this is the case lambda equals 3, 1, 1. And we associate every ta tableau to its kajdan lustig basis element. We calculate the matrix. And alas, uh, it's not a permutation matrix. So we can still find the trace using McDonald's theorem, but it doesn't count fixed points anymore because we don't have a permutation matrix. Um, but there's lots you can do with the matrix. Now, one thing you can do is take the QR decomposition. So you write this matrix as a product of an orthogonal matrix and an upper triangular matrix. And then it turns out uh, in this case that Q is actually the permutation, it's a permutation matrix. And if you check, it's actually the permutation matrix for promotion. And so the main result of my thesis, which I did uh, 
collaborated with my supervisor, Oda Jacobi at Sydney University, was that if you take an arbitrary shape lambda and calculate this QR decomposition, it turns out that this Q matrix is actually the permutation matrix for promotion. So this information about promotion is still sort of hidden in this matrix somehow, but actually extracting information about the fixed points at the moment still seems out of reach. So there's lots of open questions in this field. Um, lots of more examples of the cyclic sieving phenomenon to look at using Catalan numbers and other stuff. So hopefully there's things to think about. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you, Fern, for excellent talk, leaving us with a bit of teaser of open questions at the end there. Um, uh, any questions, feel free to mention in chat or, or put your hand up. Oh yeah, Jack, feel free to unmute and ask your question. Um, maybe this was covered and I just didn't understand it, but is there a good intuition for why this promotion action is like well-defined or are there lots of ways to promote a certain tableau? Uh, yeah, so, so the idea is you always want, you always want to get a standard tableau out. Um, so you kind of always have to, you always have to swap with the smallest box. So because if I swap with the three, uh, you'll see that I'll get my first row will be like three, two, five, eight. So it won't be standard anymore. Uh, so you, yeah, you won't get an increasing row anymore. And so this is kind of a uniquely defined map uh, and it's, it's fairly easy to define the inverse of this map too. So you can kind of tell that you, you always get a bijection. Um, I, I will say as well, this also applies to uh, semi-standard Tableau. So those allow for repeating elements. And then you can kind of choose which, which are the ones you want to do first. Uh, but it turns out actually it's very well defined as in sort of no matter which one you choose, you always get the same, the same outcome. So all of these like actions on Tableau are sort of very, very well behaved. Uh, could I ask uh, where, what was the original context for this promotion operation? Did it appear from this representation theory context or was there some other reason people were studying? Uh, yeah, that's a, great, that's a great point. So like th this promotion operation really, uh, so there's another, there's another operation on Santa Tableau called evacuation. Uh, and this, this had been very well studied because it was proved that in this kind of ge very, very general case, so kind of for all coxeter groups, not just uh, the symmetric group, uh, if you act by the longest element, so this special dignified element of the Coxeter group uh, on this kajdan lustig basis, then you always get a permutation matrix. Uh, and in the case of this, in the case of the symmetric group, um, this permutation happens to be this evacuation operator on Tableau. Uh, and it comes up in many, many like forms in like crystal theory and category theory and all these things. Uh, and the promotion operator is sort of built out of this evacuation operator in a specific way. And so like it, it really does come from the representation theory but it's sort of like lucky that we actually get this sort of very nice way to actually talk about it. Like it turns out to be a very nice map um, anyway. But there's a lot of sort of theory about these like jeu de taquin um, slides and like sliding boxes around in Tableau and stuff. And there's a lot of theory, um, like little Wood Richardson coefficients and all these things, but they all kind of relate back to uh, the representation theory of the symmetric group. Yeah, but it's a bit sort of artificial in a way. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> My supervisor uh, <laughs> had, to, had, to, had to do it badly a few times before I could do it well. Any other questions for Fern? Ah, uh, well. Uh, right after this, there is uh, some general social time in the gather.town room. So if you, I'm sure if you have other lengthy questions, other uh, more long form questions of Aiden or Fern, you can talk to either of them there or Indeed. throughout the rest of the conference. Um, so let's thank Fern and Aiden again for their excellent talks and have, have a good rest of the conference. Thank you, everyone.